Hi fans of structural geology and tectonics. This video is the first of two videos focused on fold and thrust belts and how shoveling snow is an excellent analog for fold and thrust belt development. And I should mention that this series of videos was inspired by snow shoveling videos created by Richard Almendinger, an emeritus structural geologist at Cornell University. I'll link his page that includes those original videos in this video's description. Well, let's first provide some context to the actual snow shoveling experiment. First, what is a fold and thrust belt? Well, a fold and thrust belt, as the name implies, is a belt of folded and reverse or thrust vaulted rock. They are common, if not ubiquitous, components of convergent margins. Let's look at a couple examples. First, we'll consider the Andes. Focusing on the central Andes, which is formed by the eastward subduction of the Nazca Plate under the South American Plate, the following major tectonic features can be identified here. First, starting with the subducting plate moving eastward, there is the trench, then the fore arc, followed by the volcanic and magmatic rock dominated arc, and then one specific type of fold and thrust belt. In this case, it is a foreland fold and thrust belt, which here is generated by crustal shortening between the arc and the undeformed foreland basin to the east. Note within the fold and thrust belt there are ridges parallel to the whole mountain range. Such ridges can be characteristic of fold and thrust belts. The ridges are in part produced by the folds and the thrust within the belt. Now let's look at another example. This one associated with a chain of islands called the Lesser Antilles, which separates the Caribbean Sea from the Atlantic Ocean. Here, a portion of the South American plate's oceanic crust is subducted to the west under the Caribbean plate. Similarly, some of the major tectonic features include, from east to west, an accretionary prism, then the volcanic and magmatic rock-dominated arc, which makes up many of the islands of the Lesser Antilles, and lastly, a back arc basin. Focusing on the southern part of the accretionary prism, we can see, where there is good bathymetry data, a similar collection of arc parallel ridges as found in the foreland fold and thrust belt of the Andes. This is to be expected because accretionary prisms are fold and thrust belts. Accretionary prisms are formed by sediments being scraped off the subducting plate during subduction. The overall structure and deformation style is essentially identical to any other fold and thrust belt. The last example we'll consider is this section of the Rocky Mountains on the border between Canada and the United States. Specifically, we'll focus on this section in northwestern Montana. Here, we again can see a series of ridges which I hope you can see is potentially a very good indicator of a fold and thrust belt. But this fold and thrust belt extends much further west than the obvious ridges, emphasizing that fold and thrust belts do not always have such well-defined ridges. This is another foreland fold and thrust belt produced by a convergent plate boundary once located to the west. This drove the mostly Jurassic to Cretaceous age severe orogeny. The severe orogeny was one of the major tectonic events that helped build the Rocky Mountains. Overall, the severe orogeny had a very similar relative plate arrangement to what is currently seen in the Andes. Let's look at the geologic map of the area. You can see a multitude of thrust faults across the map, with the teeth placed on the hanging wall side of the thrust. Only a few folds are shown in red. Many more exist but aren't shown due to scale. To get a better sense of the internal structures of the fold and thrust belt, let's focus on this portion of the cross section through the belt. Just a few of the thrusts and or reverse faults are marked by red arrows. A few of the folds, both synclines and anticlines, are marked by green arrows. Additionally, I'll highlight the lowest most thrust that separates deformed fold and thrust bell rocks above from the undeformed rocks below. This is called the décollement. If we consider the extent of the deformed rocks in the fold and thrust belt, you can see it approximates a wedge with the décollement defining the base of the wedge and the land surface defining the top of the wedge. Certainly there's some uncertainty with the cross section as it does not extend very deep into the crust and erosion has removed rock from the surface. But analysis of fold and thrust belts where these variables can be well constrained confirms a wedge shape is an accurate depiction of the fold and thrust belt cross section. Given this shape, the geometry of the wedge is described by the following angles. Alpha is the angle between the horizontal and the décollement at the base of the wedge, and beta is the angle between the horizontal and the land surface. Alpha plus beta is called the critical taper. The critical taper is the fundamental geometric parameter of the wedge and is controlled by the strength of the décollement and the strength of the rock and faults throughout the wedge. If the décollement becomes weaker, then the critical taper is reduced, and vice versa. Similarly, 
a wedge with stronger rocks, but with all less being equal, will have a smaller critical taper angle in comparison. Erosion too is an important process that reduces the taper angle and, in part, may dictate where deformation occurs such that the critical taper is maintained. So an important point is that everywhere within the wedge, it is very near failure, which could be represented by a more Coulomb failure criteria diagram as shown. For the sake of brevity, I will not cover the details of such diagrams, but because everywhere within the wedge is at or very near failure, it is very easy for deformation to continuously move from location to location within the belt as necessary in order to maintain the critical taper as the wedge grows with continued crustal shortening. So there is a constant balance between processes that thicken the wedge and those that thin the wedge such that the critical taper is maintained. The critical taper can be considered the equilibrium angle for the wedge. There is a lot in this diagram, but this will help explain many of the things seen in the snow shoveling video. First, we must define the relative directions for a foreland fold and thrust belt such as this. The foreland is out in front of the wedge. The hinterland is in the opposite direction. It is back towards the convergent boundary. Erosion from the top of the wedge reduces the wedge taper. Those sediments are often deposited out in the foreland basin, which is to the right of the wedge, and those sediments may eventually become part of the wedge as it grows. A forethrust is a thrust where the hanging wall moves towards the foreland. Forethrusts therefore dip towards the hinterland. These are the most common type of faults found in fold and thrust belts. The relative ages of fore thrusts often follows a very consistent pattern in that the most hinterland of the fore thrusts is the oldest and the fore thrusts get progressively younger moving towards the foreland, such that the decollement is the youngest and following this pattern should be the only active thrust in an actively building fold and thrust belt. This age pattern is called in sequence thrusting. However, this pattern is not always followed as deformation, as will be seen, must move around within the wedge to maintain the critical taper. If deformation moved towards the hinterland through reactivation of an older thrust or development of a new thrust in the middle of the fold and thrust belt, this younger, more hinterland thrust is called an out-of-sequence thrust. Depending on the location and sequence of thrusting, thrusting may either increase or decrease the wedge taper. Next are back thrusts, which are thrusts that dip towards the foreland and the hanging wall moves towards the hinterland. They will increase wedge taper. Lastly, normal faults may develop within the wedge too, which of course reduces taper. Though not depicted, folds will develop throughout the wedge as well. Now that we understand the theory behind fold and thrust belts, the second video in this series will detail the development of a fold and thrust belt created by pushing snow with a snow shovel.